um, the Fitness Roadshow. In previous episodes, we've talked a lot about running mechanics, uh, proper running mechanics and agility as well. And uh, I suppose we just thought that the next step along that train really is the the proper jump mechanics. Um, there's a lot going into running mechanics and that at the minute uh, within the GA, but there's not so much being put out there in terms of proper jump mechanics and what that can actually mean for the, the athlete. So before we get too much into that, I'll just get you to pop on to the next slide there, Ian. We are going to get you to um do a little survey for us so if everybody can see the um the website along the bottom here in red if everybody can go onto that website you can either do it on your um on your computer there or on your phone just polev.com forward slash sure door 909 we've got two questions that we just want to kick off tonight with just to sort of set the scene for what we're going to be talking about so the first one is why is it important to think about and discuss jumping within the GAA? so thinking about what we've looked at in the previous um episodes of the roadshow of running mechanics and agility we're going to apply that same thinking now to to jump in and why why have you logged on tonight why do you think it's important for us to discuss this tonight so if you can head on over to polev.com forward slash share door 909 and you'll have that question in front of you if you want to just fill that out and we'll see what responses we get Okay, so starting to come in there now we have to claim possession, catch a high ball, also for movement and agility, good stuff. Yeah, I think there's a couple of ways of looking at this sort of question, isn't it? Isn't there, Sarah? There is, yeah, absolutely. To catch a high ball, yeah. To give an explosive power and injury avoidance, excellent. To get the ball first, I like that. Yeah, lots of good answers coming in there, guys. Any other reasons why we think so? To prevent injury, good stuff. Jump and catch and how to land properly, excellent. Contesting for high balls, evading players who fall in front of you. The aid in performance. Yeah, some very broad ones here, some good ones though. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, explosive power and landing properly. Excellent. That's some uh, some really good um, info back for us, guys. We're going to move on to the to the next question. Um, contest from possession. Sorry, just seen coming in there as well. So hopefully you'll have the next question up there. And it's how many times do you think a player jumps per game? Now, obviously, we can say this varies um, whether you're a midfielder to a cornerback. There's a big variation there. But I want you just to consider all 15 players and take an average across the game how how often do you think a typical player jumps per game so a first person in there 20 to 30 times 20 times ten to fifteen times thirty times twenty five twenty five to thirty twenty to thirty times fifteen to twenty times 30 times a game. So nowhere, but nowhere smaller than 10, nowhere bigger than 30, kind of 10 to 30 is yeah, our edge. Yeah, 10 to 30. Perfect. So the only research, unfortunately, we have in this area, guys, there's none in the GEA at the moment. The only research we have to turn to is um, a soccer study, which found that um, on average, a player jumps 15 times per game. So I think we're, we're pretty on the mark there with our with our guesstimations there. So well done, guys. So it's just kind of to give you an idea, guys, of how important it is um, and how often it happens in a, in a singular match or in a singular training session. And therefore, how many opportunities there is or incidents to injury um, with jumping and landing. So the injury prevention we're going to look at tonight then, guys, um, Many studies have shown that leg injuries are predominant in the GA by up to sixty-seven, sorry, seventy-six percent of um, of the injuries that we that we occur. And majority of these injuries are non-contact injuries, and they're resulting from overuse 
or high stress loads. So the high stress loads that we're talking about tonight are the forces created for you to jump and then land in control. And that causes a lot of stress in the leg muscles and the ligaments. So a study back in 07 showed that up to 86% of non-contact cruciate injuries resulted from single leg landings, which is often what we do predominantly within the GA. So we're using that other leg, we're driving it up for both um, performance and protection. So up to 86% of cruciate injuries um, can result from landing on that single leg. And a further AFL study then as well reported that 46% of injuries come from landing badly in juniors football. And that they actually inter, uh, implemented an intervention program then teaching players how to land correctly and they greatly reduced their injury occurrence. So we mentioned um, just cruciate there and non-contact injuries with cruciate. That is predominantly an injury that we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, mostly because it is a very prevalent one within the GAA um, and it's a very severe one as well. So we will be talking a little bit more about that. So I'll just get you to pop on the next slide, Ian, please. Now, there is... Um... Yeah. Sorry, Sorry just on that, Sarah, just even if you look at the stats from the AFL there and how similar that is in the way they compete for possession in the air to GAA, like it's, it's scary how prevalent these sort of injuries are. Absolutely. Now, there are a number of injuries that can come from from uh, jumping and landing incorrectly. But as we said, the cruciate is, is one of the, the most feared anyways in the GA at the minute, and it is very prevalent. So um, a soccer study then in 09 found that uh, knee ligament injuries accounted for up to 31% and 37% of total time lost from football for male and female players. So that's over a third of time lost from the sport for female players and just under a third for male players due to this one um, this one injury occurrence. And to understand the relationship between jumping and landing and the resulting ligament damage and why it's a high injury rate, you need to think about the forces that are going through the legs when you're landing. So when you land from a jump, the force that's going through your legs, it's your weight times gravity and your gravity is calculated at 9.33 meters per second. Okay, we're not going to get too technical, don't worry. But if you take, um, if you take for simplicity of explanation, if you take a 10 stone player, when they jump and they land, they're experiencing over nine times that weight and forces down through the legs. And, into, and if the muscles aren't strong enough or activated in the correct way to deal with that force and stabilize the knee, that slack falls onto the cruciate. And when that slack gets too much, the cruciate then snaps, all right? right? So if you imagine again, if you're jumping and landing onto a single leg, again, 10 stone player, just for simplicity, they're experiencing over nine times that weight in forces down through a single leg. So it's, it's quite a lot of force and that's, um, that's why it's one of a, a very high prevalent uh, in, incidence to injury for the cruciate and for severe, um, knee injuries and as you can see there at the bottom just um some research of, of team handball and some GA uh, players found that the knee is it's the second highest incidence of injury so the second most likely injury we're, we're likely to get but it's the most severe and all the knee injuries the cruciate is both the most frequent and the most severe and that's from a, a collection of different studies as well so it's a very prevalent one as we said uh, and quite a nasty one so we get you to move on just to the next slide there please Ian. sorry it just takes a couple of seconds to yeah no, no when worries. i do it yeah so um we know we know a lot about the cruciate in terms of um talking about oh your one did your cruciate or that but there are some you know very serious long-term consequences from cruciate injury so Less than 50% of athletes will actually return to their sport within a year. We generally talk about a nine-month recovery period or rehabilitation period for somebody coming back from a single cruciate tear. But actually, less than 50% will actually make it back within 12 months, never mind nine months. And less than 65% will return within two years to full capacity. 24% will actually change sport because they'll be looking for something that in their mind is a little bit safer, more stable for their knee, and they're less likely to injure it and 11% will cease sport and activity altogether, which is quite shocking as well. And there's some serious long-term um, problems that can come from it as well. So we're looking at things like chronic knee problems, 
cartilage injury. So a very high percentage of um, cruciate injuries have come along with cartilage injuries. And cartilage is just, um, it's like a little pillow between your thigh bone and your shin bone, just stopping the, uh, the two bones smashing against each other. And that can often get damaged with the cru uh, cruciate injury as well, which can cause um, more long-term injuries as well. Obviously, knee instability and development of osteoarthritis as well. So approximately 50% of cruciate injured athletes would show evidence of osteoarthritis within 10 to 20 years, um, whether they have surgery or whether they treat it conservatively. So if you consider a 14 or 15 or 16 year old um, youth ad or youth player that you have that uh, tears the cruciate, by the time they're 25, they could actually be showing signs, signs of having osteoarthritis arthritis um, within that injured knee, which is quite worrying as well. So we'll pop on to the next slide there, Ian. So we look just um, for a slide or two at uh, females and the cruciate. And the reason we'll do this, just for anybody who's coaching uh, female teams, females are significantly higher to tear their cruciate than their male counterparts. So a number of studies, um, as you can see on the slide, they're showing that they're 68 times more likely to rupture their, their cruciate than uh, their, their male counterparts. And when they do that, they're 12 times more likely to suffer another cruciate injury on the other leg. And that just comes from overcompensating then because they're not feeling stable within that injured leg. They overcompensate on the other side and end up um, rupturing the other, other side as well. You can see on the slide there that there's some more um, some more information there from the LGFA on that in terms of the, the long term and the financial issues with uh, tearing the cruciate. But I do just want to talk you through the diagram on the right hand side. So we all know the cruciate. We're all talking about the cruciate. It's uh, one of those things we fear to hear uh, that somebody has done their cruciate, but not all of us maybe know exactly what it is or what it ro its role is. So if we look at the wee diagram on the right hand side, you'll see that we'll have um, the knee stripped back just to have a look. So we can see from the top that we have the thigh bone or the femur coming in from the top. And then from the bottom, we have our two uh, lower leg bones, which is the tibia and fibia. And if we go to the both the, the left hand side, and the, the two either sides, the left hand side and the right hand side, you'll see that there's a ligament joining the thigh bone to the shin bone on each side. So that's two of our ligaments, our medial and, the, and lateral ligaments, and they just provide some stability to the knee. If we then go and look to the centre, we've got two, uh, two ligaments in an X formation, and they're going across uh, the knee, for, again from the thigh bone to the shin bones and that's where we're really getting a lot of our knee stability from is from these cross action ligaments so these are our anterior at the front and then our posterior ligament at the back and as you can see with the arrow there that the, the image is actually detecting a complete rupture of the SAL through the center um, so I hope there's nobody too squeamish tonight uh, we will be showing you a few pictures um, and a video um, so hopefully hopefully you won't get annoyed too much about them but that will hopefully give you an idea of what you, how your knee is actually made up by these ligaments uh, and it's not just sort of a fictional thing anymore that people are talking about when they say they've torn the cruciate so we'll move on to the next slide there and we'll just talk a little bit about why are females so much more likely to tear their cruciate uh, than their male counterparts so there are a lot of factors that lead to this higher risk for females some of them are related to aspects that we can't control or change. So we look to, to factors such as biomechanical and neuromuscular differences. And these would be things like landing with a greater knee and hip extension. So that just means landing with a, a straight leg. And what happens there is that when you land with a straight leg, your quads are also fully extended and that increases greater pressure on your cruciate whenever your quads are close to full extension. Whereas the hamstrings, when they are activated correctly, they actually act to reduce stress on your cruciate ligament. So females are both more likely to land with their knee um, fully extended, and they're also something that we call quad dominant, which means they're more likely to let their, their quads do the work than their hamstrings. So both of those things are putting extra pressure on the knee joint 
and ultimately on the cruciate. And they have a marked imbalance then between the, the quadricep and hamstring um, strength and co-activation. The last point then there we have is the valgus knee action, and this is due to having a larger pelvis. So the valgus knee action, we have a picture in a few, uh, few slides time just to show you exactly what that is. But it's basically where the two knees want to track in towards each other. So when that player lands, and you will see it sometimes in some female players, even when they run, their knees want to, to track in towards each other. Um, so we'll move on to the next slide there, Ian. So a few pictures just to go through here, guys. Um, so this one is from a soccer player trying to kick the ball in the air. Uh, and if you just follow his movement through uh, the images from A to B to C to D, you can see obviously straight away from A that he's not going to be in perfect balance. This is what happens in, in team sports, just like our own. You can be put off balance either by moving to, to try and receive the ball or by receiving indirect contact to the torso from a challenger. As we move to, to the um, to image B, you can see that he's already starting to, to come down to land and he's done all right. He's got the, the ball of his foot down, okay? His leg isn't completely straight, but as you can see, his uh, upper body is starting to rotate to the left and this is starting to take him off balance and it's starting to put some rotation into his hip and then into his leg as well. So hopefully by image C and D, it's not as clear there, but hopefully you can start to see that that rotation has continued on down into the knee. And in the final image in D there, you can see that his knee is starting to track inwards towards the other knee and it's not remaining over his foot. So we'll move on to the next image there. We just have another one from soccer. And this time we're looking at the, um, the individual in the red and blue strip. Um, I think it's the number 10 on his back, I'm not sure. Yeah, I was thinking 13, but maybe it's 10. <laughs> but, um, I'm lucky it's a bit 13. grainy, yeah. But... Um, so yeah, it's it's a wee bit grainy on this one, guys. But I think once you get to image D, um, we'll, you can see quite clearly what's happening there. But from image A, you can see that he is up contesting the header. He started there uh, pretty much in line all through his body. By the time you get to image B, he's got one leg in the air on one leg tracking down uh, for contact with the ground. And that's just resulting from taking uh, contact to the torso while contesting the header. Coming down to see, he's landed on the ground and he can just, just about make out it from the greeniness that he's come down quite straight legged. And then into D, I think you can quite clearly see the bow in the legs there where his body weight has continued to move to the right. But unfortunately, his leg has not been able to, to deal with those forces coming down singularly and straight legged. And his knee has started again to track in towards the other one and opposite away from his center of mass. And that's what we're kind of talking about with the, the knee valgus, guys. But we'll look a little bit more at that in a second. I think those two images, Sarah, really demonstrate the importance of your torso as well, controlling that. Because you can see in the two, in the two pictures or two injuries you put in there, um, the torso head in the opposite direction is causing problems straight away. Absolutely. And you know yourself, in the images that we're going to look at at the end um, shows an individual who, in a similar position, is able to actually control things a lot better. Um, so we'll, we'll move on to the next slide. So we've just added, um, just wanted to take a second just to, to discuss this. So we've, we've, we have talked a lot about cruciate. Uh, and that is because up to eighty percent of um, non-contact injuries, um, or sorry, non non eighty percent of ACL injuries are non-contact injuries. Um, but jumping in that, and aren't the only incidents to injury uh, with this type of ACL injury. There's also sidestepping, or cutting and planting, decelerating without change in direction, and decelerating with change in direction. And we just thought it was an important uh, time to note uh, that. There are these other incidents to this injury and that they do refer back to the episodes of the Roadshow uh, from previous weeks in relation to the running mechanics and the agility as well. So just to highlight the importance of continuing with those mechanics and those um, uh, the running and the agility that the guys talked through is with in the previous episodes as well, just to help prevent um, with such serious injury.
So guys, this is um, what we're trying to look out for then. So we've got a lady here performing a, a drop jump from um, a box onto a force pit. And we're just going to talk through the, the proper mechanics then of landing to try and prevent uh, such injuries. So if we look in towards the third image or the middle image there, the first thing that I want to highlight is you can see that the, the individual's feet are starting to point downwards, okay? And what she's looking to do there is contact the ground with her ball of her foot to her midfoot, okay? And what that does, guys, is that actually activates all the muscles for proper force control throughout the legs, okay? So it's like a chain reaction. When she contacts the ground with the ball to the midfoot, she's setting in motion the correct chain reaction for everything to be activated in the correct way to absorb the forces in the correct way so that the least amount of stress is going through the knee. If we move on to the um, the next image along, uh, along the sequence there, so image number four, this person is right at the, the very end of their um, control of the Latin, because as you can see, they're starting to power off in the next image or jump up in the next image. And what you can see in this image is the triple flexion, okay? So we've got the good flexion of the ankle, the knee, and the hip, importantly, as well, okay? And this is just showing the result of uh, what has started previously by landing on the ball to the midfoot so that everything is activated correctly. And what's actually happening there then, guys, is all the muscles are activated. So the hamstrings are activated correctly to take stress off the knee and the quadriceps are activated correctly so that they are not adding stress to the knee, okay? So if that individual was starting with her knees locked out or close to extension, that would be the, the quadriceps activated fully at full extension and therefore putting stress onto the knee. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more just in the next slide. So with two different individuals here, um, we look to the to the guy on the left first of all, um, the red guy we'll call him. If you track down from his head, so we've got the different points here in a straight line down. If you track down, um, you can do it with your mouse cursor if you want, from his head to his shoulder to his hip. And if you continue that line on down to the ground, okay? And if you can continue to imagine that line from his head all the way down to the ground, okay? That line is where his centre of gravity or centre of mass is, okay? Now, if you, again, just keep looking at where that line went from his hip down to the ground and how much distance there is from that line to his knee, okay? With his centre of mass being in this area and so far behind the knee, it is constantly pulling backwards on his leg, okay? Now, where is the weak part of the leg? It's not going to be in the solidity of the muscles. It's going to be in the joint, and it's going to be in the central joint as well, okay? So all that force of his body mass is pulling backwards on his knee, okay? And what that actually does, guys, is that can lead to some of the, the very nasty hyperextension uh, injuries that we, that we can see in sport where the knee actually comes backwards on itself. And that can, can lead to ligament uh, damage to all of, the, all of the, um, the ligaments as well as other injuries as well. If we contrast that, okay, and that's because, sorry, that's because he's coming down and striking with the heel, as you can see, okay. Um, if we contrast that with the guy on the right-hand side, so the green guy, again, if you track down from his head to his shoulder to his hip and on down to the ground, you can see there's a far greater, or sorry, a far less distance between that center of mass and his knee, okay. So he doesn't have that same pressure or pull coming backwards on his knee. The other thing is because he's striking on the um, the midfoot, the ball of the foot to the midfoot, as we've said, that activates all of the joints and the muscles correctly. If you again look at the line going from his hip to his knee and compare that line with that on the guy on the red, you can see there's, there's quite a difference in the angle there, okay? And again, from the knee to the hip, there's quite a difference in the angle in both of those scenarios, okay? And that's because he is in a better uh, state of flexion on the right-hand side, okay? So all the, the, the center mass is coming down centrally to where he's striking the foot compared to pulling out uh, behind uh, and, and potentially causing injury, okay? And just one other thing to point with that as well, you know, studies have shown that when you land on the, the heel of the foot, you're putting through one and a half times 
greater force in a significantly shorter period of time than you are if you land on the ball of the foot to the midfoot. So what you're doing is actually creating a whole lot of force in a very, very short space of time right up through the leg. Whereas when you land softly on the ball of the foot to the midfoot, that force is spread over um, that force is spread over a, a greater distance and throughout all of the muscles, which means you're not absorbing as much or creating as much uh, force for the legs to to absorb. Have you anything to add to that, Ian? No, I think that's fairly comprehensive. I think even um, maybe our green fella, maybe the image of him could have been landed more on the ball of a sport, a small bit more. Yeah. But I think, I think the way you've described the, that angle, if, if you look at the, the green fella, it's nearly vertical between his hip and his knee, and mm -hmm. then as opposed to the hip knee angle of uh, the fella in red, like you. Yeah, and the, the last thing to point then is when. Dragging well. yourself forward. Yeah, the last thing to point then is just for performance, as Ian says there, the, the weight and the body mass of the green fella is moving forwards. So as soon as he lands, he is ready to straight away move forwards, whereas the, the guy, the red guy, uh, does not have that capability. Okay, All of his mass is coming down straight down and almost backwards, which is slowing him down. So he's not going to be able to land and explode off to start running um, to attack. Perfect, we'll move on to the next slide then. Here's your new knee valgus. Yeah, so this is a this is an, a nasty one. This is the the knee valgus we were speaking about then. So if we look at um, the center image first of all, you can see what I was speaking about in terms of the knees trying to track in towards each other. Okay, so because females have that larger pelvis, it puts more strain on the knees in attempt to move in in this motion towards each other. Okay, um, whereas you can see on the left hand side going from the individual's hip to knee and across the other knee and back up to hip. It's almost like a perfect square and you can even extend that down to the toe. So from the hip to the knee to the toe across to the other foot and back up again, it's almost like a perfect rectangle. In comparison um, with the individual in the, in the center image, you can see that it's almost like an upside down triangle. That's, the forces are pushing those to, uh, those two knees in towards each other to complete that triangle at the bottom. So this is a very dangerous um, position to find yourself in. And it's a very easy one to identify as, uh, with players, even just getting them to, to jump. Um, they don't have to be jumping from a box, just jumping straight up and trying to land and control. You'll see this straight away, the knee not tracking over the middle toe. Uh, and this will be a huge incidence to injury then with a lot of uh, players, not just females, but it is one that's a lot, uh, a lot more current uh, within females. So we'll move on, I think, to what's nearly our last slide, just talking about injury prevention. So we have a, a little video on this, um, on this slide, guys. Uh, we know that videos don't play too great uh, on Teams. So what we've done is we've popped the URL link to the video on YouTube in the chat. So if it doesn't play, uh, well enough for you, you can uh, get that video in the chat box there um, and copy and paste it into to YouTube and watch it. Um, so we're just going to play it now in, in a wee second. Uh, it's a video of a score from Colo Callaghan, I think from last year's championship, but we want you just to watch through the full replay. And there's a couple of points that it stops at. I want you just to try and have a look at what's happening with his body position and then we'll have a chat about it after. So is that going to play for us, Andy, think? Sarah. Yeah, I'll give this another second. If it doesn't work, um, the, like Sarah said, the video, uh, the URL is in the chat anyway, um, and we have a couple of stills from it, but it's just really struggling here. <laughs> Hmm. Um, I could uh, play on YouTube here if you want to on share for two seconds. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, that's a great idea. Okay, can you see my screen there? Yep. 
perfect so hopefully this is play all right guys or if not hopefully you are watching away at it um on your computer but we'll play it here anyway just to make sure everybody has had access to it So hopefully you have all um, been able to see that, guys. Um, do you want to pull the presentation back up there, Ian, or will I? Yeah, just two seconds, I'm sorry. So whenever um, we first do this uh, video as a team pulling this uh, webinar together, I actually had to apologize to the guys for my reaction. Um, I'm not a very squeamish person, but there's something about knees that just gets me. And I think we can all agree there that on first look, it's easy to walk away and say Con O'Callaghan's a very lucky boy to have, to have stepped up from, from that um, with no result in injury. But what we're actually going to do, we've, we've broken it down to two screenshots here that is hopefully going to help, um, help show exactly why he was able to get up and play on with no lasting, uh, no lasting injury from that. Um, so it will come up now in a wee second for us. There we are. Perfect. So the image just on the left, guys, so this is also where I just paused the video uh, that you're watching. Um, but the image on the left, hopefully, first of all, what you can see there with his right foot, it is already pointing down and tracking down to try and make contact with the ground with the ball to the middle of his foot. OK, so that's the first point. A lot of individuals in this exact instance where he's been tackled and his body weight is now moving backwards against him, what would have happened is they would have landed on the heel of their foot and they would have landed with a straight leg. And that would have, you can imagine just looking at that, the shock that that would have sent straight up through your leg. So it's it's likely that some part of the leg would have given to the, the forces that was being felt, felt there. But his foot is already tracking down, even though he's being tackled, even though he's completely out of shape, his foot is tracking down to try and land with the ball of the foot to the mid foot. The second image then on the right hand side, what you can hopefully see is now that his foot is down on the ground and planted, his knee has not continued to move forward with his initial momentum. What his knee has actually done there has continued to track over his foot. OK, and you can actually see that there's a pretty good straight line going from his knee over his toes. And in fact, for the shape that he's found himself in, there's not actually a, a half bad line going from his hip to his knee down to his toe as well. So what we're really saying here, guys, is the reason Carlo Callahan was able to get himself into this shape, land the way he did and get it up and go again is because of years of plyometric and proprioceptive training. So he's not thinking about this while he's jumping and landing but his neuromuscular pathway is their set in stone from years of training to know that the ball of the foot to land softly, you have to land on the ball of the foot to absorb those forces, to start that chain reaction up through the leg, and then that the, the knee will continue to, to track over the toe to protect his knee and other areas of his leg as well as much as possible. So hopefully hopefully those two images make sense. Um, anything to add to that, Ian? Uh, yeah, I think like that's just an incredible that he was able to adjust himself and like you said, his body control to even subconsciously, he's, you can see how clearly he's pointing his toe down, looking for the ground in the first image and everything. Um, and then the, the knee tracks perfectly. So I just think it's an incredible really. And I think it really illustrates the benefits of whether it be tr training for strength, because obviously you look at the size of his legs and, um, and also your plyometric training as well. Perfect. Well, listen, guys, that's pretty much it from the, the injury prevention. Um, you can pop in any questions you have there into the chat box uh, in regards to injury, injury prevention. But I think, Ian, we'll maybe we'll be far on with your end and we'll come back to all the questions at the end. Yeah, that sounds perfect because I'm um, so a little bit conscious of time. So, yeah, that's yeah. perfect. 
Perfect. So any questions you have, guys, on the injury prevention side of things, just pop them into the chat box now and we'll get back to them um, towards the end of the presentation then. Thanks very much. There's also, guys, um, a raise hand function. So if you hit the little three dots, the usual thing, um, there's an option to raise your hand. So if you'd prefer to actually voice your question, um, if you think you might illustrate it better, we can, we can do that as well. Perfect. So I'm going to focus on a bit more of the jump performance. So obviously, if we're jumping, like we said, 15 to 20 to 30 times in the game, we obviously want to do it to maximum ability. And if we think about the, the reasons we gave that jumping is important, if the reasons we gave to Sarah, so many of them are winning primary possession. Like, look at the way Aidan O'Shea is here um, getting up. He must be getting up. 12, he must, his hand must be getting up maybe 11, 12 feet to get the ball. Um, so it can obviously be a huge advantage in a game. Um, so we need to be able to do it well on top of the injury prevention stuff. Now, Sarah, I don't know if he'll land that one particularly well, but um, we'll see. Okay, so the way I'm going to break this down um, and the way we generally improve jumping is through two things. So power development, so that would be developing strength. And like I mentioned, with Conor Callan's massive thighs. Um, so the power development and strength give you that control and also be able to jump up and explosively jump up higher. And then we've also got the plyometrics. So these are, it's basically a form of like jump training or fast explosive movements training. Um, but it's a brilliant way to work on getting up off the ground as high as you can, as fast as you can. So firstly, if we just look at before, just ignore the text to the left for the minute. And if we just look at the curve on the right. So this is what um, in technical sports science terms, this is what we call a force velocity curve. So basically, if you look at it, <clears throat> if you look at the curve, we've got force up the left. So as things get heavier, they, they're higher up the curve. And then we've got velocity on the right. So as things get faster, they're further across to the right. So what we have, we have got strength, speed, power, and speed, strength, okay? So this is just a combination of, thing, of things, whether it might be moving different ways at different speeds. So basically, the heavier something is, the slower you move it. The, the lighter something is, or if your body weight, the faster you move it. So if we look at in the middle, in the, toward the power section, we've got our weighted jumps, our med ball throws and our plyometrics. So what we're saying here is that jumping is a power exercise. So it's not just down to strength and it's not just down to speed. It's actually somewhere in the middle. So what we need to do to develop um, our power, so we need to actually practice our jumping to work in the middle of the curve, but also we want to be able to shift the curve. So we want to be able to move, train our strength, train our speed, so that our whole curve, as you can see with this uh, illustration, that our whole curve is moving in the best direction. So we're getting stronger, we're jumping more powerfully. We need to train the three at the same time to shift the curve. So if I want to train my jump, I can only get so much better by, by doing only power and speed work. I need to do some strength work to back that up and shift the curve as well. So I hope that makes sense. If there's any questions on that, absolutely fire them in. We can take them as well. So on the power development side, I'm not going to say, right, to develop your jump, what you need to do is you need to go into the gym and you need to do four sets of five in the back shot. I'm not going to go into that. Um, just to try and prescribe a gym program to everyone who's listening to the call and all their teams they work with and everything, that's just impossible, whether it be it's too broad an audience, too broad too broad a topic to go into so the main thing we want to keep in mind here is Sarah mentioned it earlier with the triple flexion so if we look at the bubble on the right here so this is a man doing a jump so he's squatting down to jump up if you can see uh, we've got the flexion so he's got a bend in his ankle a bend in his and that is remarkably similar to the position that we see Michael Darren McCauley in with his deadlift and it's uh, Bowden Barrett, the rugby player down the bottom in his squat. Each of those have a have the bend in each of the three joints. So I'm not going to 
again, like I said, I'm not going to prescribe what exercises we need to do be doing, but just keep in mind what we're trying to achieve. So if we are trying to achieve a player to go down into this position and powerfully come out up out of it, then these sort of exercises with, that with the same requirements will obviously work in work in that right direction, if that makes sense. So we're trying to be specific to that movement. So these sort of exercises where we're bending down and coming up are very specific to that motion in the jumping. Um, so obviously with our jump then, and as Sarah mentioned, also we've got our triple extension. So where we come up out of the jump and we've got we've ex- fully extended through our, our hip, knee and ankle as squat and your deadlift wouldn't have that. So that's where we need to supplement in our power exercises. So maybe like um, a jump squat, just for example, or then our actual plyometric exercises now in a few minutes. Also, um, just a quick note, a single and double leg. So we're obviously not always jumping off, off two legs. If you think about a midfielder going up again, like Sarah said, not to take everything Sarah said. But if we think of our midfielder going up with his knee in front of him to protect himself and to get a bit of momentum, he's generally jumping off the one leg. So we also need to be able to develop our strength on, on one leg as well whether that just be step-ups or lunges or sitting to a box and standing up again with the one leg, but also trying to avoid that knee valgus. So I'm not going to, this is my only slide in the power development. It's just that to be aware of, we do need to develop our strength to obviously be able to jump higher. But if I was to go in to try and tell you what to do with your youth athletes or whatever teams you work with, on the power development side for jumping, that's all different webinar. I think that's probably more of a module for a college course. Not more. So what I'm going to focus on more so is the plyometrics. So what I've got up here, it's a bit slow coming up here on my one, I think. But what we've got here, I've got a slide on. Sarah, is that coming up for you? Yep, that's yeah, up. Yeah, it's up now. Okay. So... This is a big technical scary term, but I'll try to break it down as best as I can. So the stretch shortening cycle is a movement or um, an action where there's an eccentric movement. So basically where you go down and into that flexion, followed quickly by a powerful uh, concentric contraction where you explode out of it. So try and explain it as best I can. If you look at the diagram, so it's eccentric is when he's going down. So he goes down with see the first two with the yellow and the red arrows. And then when he gets to the bottom, he has to really quickly transition from going down to going up. So he doesn't get to the bottom, sit there for three seconds and then jump. He's going down and as quick as he can, he's changing from one to the other to shoot back up. So you can see the green arrow and it's a bluey gray arrow. And that's him in his concentric trying to powerfully, um, powerfully contract his muscles to get up. So the idea behind the stretch shortening cycle is that going down and up is more powerful than just standing from straight standing, just going up. So that's why you see, if you see anyone going for a jump, they always bend themselves down and then explode out of it. You do it without thinking. So what we need to do is we need to train that movement where you go down and up. And there's two branches of the stretch shortening cycle. So the fast stretch shortening cycle and slow stretch shortening cycle. So, or SSC, is, I'll call it from now on, just because that's a lot of words. So, from starting with our two feet on the ground. So we'll just start with our two feet on the ground and we'll go up and down. Um, whereas the fast SSC is generally, we might be a bounce or a series of jumps one after the other. If you want to get technical with it, the slow SSC takes over 0.25 of a second on the spends over 0.25 of a second on the ground, and the fast is less than 0.25 of a second on the ground. But that's not something to worry about. Slow SSC, you're generally starting with your feet on the ground. Fast SSC, you're generally bouncing or you're starting from a previous jump. Now, we'll try and get into it a bit then. So plyometrics themselves, plyometrics themselves is a term used to describe quick powerful movements using a pre-stretch that involves the SSC. So basically a plyometric method using that stretch shortening cycle. So 
it's a training method where you go down and spring up. Um, this it work, isn't working directly on strength or uh, max strength, like we would have seen at the top end of our curve a minute ago. This is working on reactive strength, which is linked in with our power, so it'll be in the middle of the curve. So we're looking at a reactive strength that can be defined as an ability to go from eccentric to contract, concentric quickly, and it can be used as a measure of explosiveness. So if you take one thing from plyometrics, is that we're, we're using plyometrics to try and train explosiveness. Simple as that. So obviously we've got our fast SSC exercises. So we're going to train our jumping with them. But that same, those same plyometric exercises are also tra training general explosiveness. So like if you think about when you're running, you're pushing off explosively one at short contact time. So the, the likes of plyometric training is brilliant for helping with speed development as well. Sorry, and there's just a question in chat there from Ushin. He's yeah. asking, should you do a jump squat with shoes on or off? Um, yeah, I'd probably go with the shoes on um, just for, Sarah, you might come on in on this in the injury prevention side, but just for if he's landing flat, but I think there's probably more of a chance of him going into a knee valgus um, and you're probably experiencing more force with that direct land directly onto the ground than you would without the shoe, with, with shoes on, sorry. Sarah, I don't know if you'd have any opinion on that and maybe the injury prevention side. Um, yeah, just to my knowledge, the research does show, um, you know, either running or jumping and landing on shod, as it would be called, which is shod versus on shod, no shoes. It does make greater benefit of your elastic recoil energy around the Achilles and stuff like that. But there's the, the research as to how that um, translates into sport specific. Um, you know, when we go and put on our football boots, for example, and start landing from these jumps, the research doesn't really show that it's, it correlates if you go and train with, with no uh, no shoes and then go and put football boots on. So it's it's not really you're better off just doing it with the with the shoes on, really, um, because that's more closely linked to what you're going to be doing. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a great reason and more more scientific basis behind that than my guess. That Ian, uh, sound for coming in with that question there. Cheers for that. No worries. Um. So. What we're looking at here, guys, so on our, so these are our progressions, our step-by-step -step of how we go about training our plyometrics. Now, again, tonight, there's only so much I can do or we can go into on plyometrics via webinar. So hopefully, this is something we can roll out as workshops down the line. Um, but just for something to you, for yourselves to keep in mind when you're going back to your teams or back to your players. So we're going to work on our landing mechanics first. So they're the building blocks. So that's the... We're going to work on exercises to basically nail what Sarah was going through at the start, whether that be keeping our knees out, tracking over our toes, or keeping our um, torso in line, having our flexion in our knee when we were landing down, landing on the ball of our foot. So all those details Sarah went through, they're the basics, they're the building blocks. We don't do anything else more advanced until we have them mastered. Building on from the landing mechanics, we start with the slow SSC first. So We'll, I'll go through a few slow SSC exercises now as an example in a minute, but these can be very good for actually really honing in our landing technique. So we don't, don't, we don't progress on from the slow until we have the, land, the landing technique perfect with those exercises as well. And then finally, we've got the fast SSC. So these would be more intense, more... Um, sort of sapping in terms of physically and kind of uh, neurally as well. Um, and obviously they're a lot faster, they're a lot harder to maybe control. So they'd be the last thing we'd work on. But I'll go through in a minute a few more exercises that we probably could, you could probably take away with you more so. Um, this next slide is, is uh, so it's different sort of progressions on plyometric exercises. Now I'll send out the slides so you could probably be able to get a bit of a better look at them. Some of them are a bit blurred and a bit stretched, um, but what I really thought it'd be useful to get it in. So it's looking at the different kind of directions and elements of pl 
supply metrics we are we can look at. But firstly, I'll get you to have a look at the writing in blue down the bottom underneath it. So just kind of in that same idea, we're going to go through building blocks. So we we'll start bilateral, so working two legs before we work with one leg. So if we can get that right, so say if we're working on a, a double leg landing, that's the very first thing. If we can get that right, brilliant. Then we'll try working on a single leg, land, single leg landing. Then same as the last slide. Last slide, we'll do slow before fast. We'll do short before long, so doing short jumps before doing long jumps. Always looking for quality over quantity. We'll do general movement kind of preparation before maybe we progress to very sport specific movements. And then the last one there is linear. Remind for your actual landing technique and that sort of stuff. We're also looking at, you're also building different muscles, whether it be your adductors and your other different bits and pieces like that. So if we look, we'll go down through the black, the black headings there now as well. So vertical, so these are obviously a jump straight up in the air. Um, that's something we have to consider. We'd go horizontal, so go, trying to go forward, which would be a great help for our running technique as well. We have lateral, so out to the side, like I just mentioned, rotational. So that would be very helpful again to avoid injury, like what Sarah was saying. And even if we go back to the couple of images that a soccer player Sarah had up at the start, we saw that their torso and their body was rotating a bit as well, particularly the first one, the fella in yellow, I think, Sarah. And being able to control that and control our landings and our jumps with the rotation is important as well. And then last one we got down the bottom here, we have our fast SSC. There's, so there's things to develop. I'm just going to leave that slide, that slide I left in there. So you can obviously take those the exercises, Google them when I send out the slides, um, throw them into YouTube. It's just there's so many exercises I could go through tonight. I'm going to go through a few little sets of sample bits and pieces you could work on um, now in a second. But that's just that what we have here is nearly like an exercise bank in terms of, okay, I want to work on some vertical jumping tonight. We could do tall, short landings. And then in a couple of weeks time, you might work on a counter movement jump when you progress on up the way and it's working through the chain. Perfect. Oh, missing session one. There we are, session one. So I'm gonna quickly go through three little mini sample sessions. Um, work our plyometrics so this the, what we have in mind here is so say if you have a 15 minute pitch based warm up so if you have your youth players so whether it be under 11s 13s up to minors on the pitch you have a 15 minute warm up before training so you might have 10 minutes going through your GA15 or your different your ramp protocol so as you come to the P for the potentiator the power and speed element of your ramp warm up we're going to actually use that to work on our plyometrics. So first one there, we've got our broad jump. So this one is slow SSE because we're starting with our feet on the ground and there's a few different techniques, work uh, cues put in there. And we're just jumping down and jumping as far forward as we can. Again, you can see in the image, focused on good landing techniques. So this is a good one for beginners because um, it's really honing in the technique. Progression of that could be a squat jump to go up instead of vertical. We've got a 90 degree squat jump is the next one. So that's what the image is below. So the girl, like I mentioned a minute ago, that's where you've got a bit of an anti-rotation element in it. So jump up and in the air, you're turning. So you're landing facing another direct, uh, landing either facing to the left or the right, whichever way you turn, you turn. And the progression to that would be to do it 180 degrees. So jump facing forward and land facing in the opposite direction. Also would be a slow SSC because you're starting with your feet on the ground. And then we've got a pogo jump after that. The pogo jump would be fast SSC because it's bouncing, it's continuous. You spend very little time on the ground and the progression for that would be going to, from double leg to single leg. So I've just got a couple more of these sessions, guys. And that's pretty much it then. Um, so if you do have any questions or anything I've gone through already, you can start throwing them into the chat. What we've just got um, in this session, there's the box, jump, box jumps. So 
uh, we've got looking at landing technique again, slow SSC exercise. So you can also, even if you want, if she's jumping down from the box, then we can use that as an exercise for landing technique as well. All these sort of plyometric exercises, very important actually note this. Um, plyometrics in this jumping is a very intense exercise. It's physically quite demanding. And even, especially when you're learning the technique, it can be mentally quite demanding. You can find players um, struggling to get their head around it nearly. It actually is quite taxing that way. So with, the, with that all in mind, and because we're trying to train power, we're, not, we're never really training more than five or six reps at a time. So if, if we're say, we'll take this session two, if we're looking at this, box jumps, we might go three sets of five. Or so I might do, if you're doing your pitch base warm up and we're on the lateral skater jumps, it might be three jumps with the right, three jumps with the left, take a break, do something else, come back to it then. So the lateral skater jumps is a good one here because we're coming across the body. And again, we're trying to land with that quite a straight line between the hip, the knee and the ankle. And the tall short landings, I mentioned that a minute ago, brilliant one for working on the very basic landing technique. So you're up on your tippy toes, hands above your head, and you just drop down into that solid um, kind of athletic position to try and catch yourself and land in with that. You can actually see like um, the way this fella has landed in the image. He actually looks like he has got the square for his hips, knees, and ankles that Sarah mentioned earlier. And finally, then we've got another session here with a couple of medicine balls. So this is maybe be a, a little bit different. It might be one you could do off a ball wall. You could use a football. The wall ball, first one's there. So we're going down and we're using that triple extension. So like we mentioned it previously, we've got the triple extension through the hips, knees and ankles. All that force is being used. Um, but we're also mixing in with the upper body. So you're having to do, have to control his upper body and his lower body together. It's also. There's more force to come up out of it. So it would be actually, it would kind of shift the exercise a little bit further up the force velocity curve because there's more weight to it, more resistance to it. That'll be another slow SSD exercise. Uh, tuck jumps, because we're if we're if he's rebounding, so if he's straight up, straight down, like the poker jumps, that could be a fast SSC if you do it that way, or if you're walking into it and doing it, it could be a slow SSC. It depends. And then ball slams, as you can see, from we're starting nice and tall. It's actually like a bit of a progression from the tall to short landings. So starting with the ball overhead and bringing it down with force but she's coming down with force and into that la strong landing position. So it's actually nearly a reverse of a jump, but it'd be, it'd be a really good one for working on your landing mechanics at the start. Now, they're just, these are just a sample of exercises, guys, um, that can be done for a couple of minutes as part of a warm-up um, that you could progress from landing mechanics, working through your slow SSC and onto your fast SSC. Um, Again, if anyone has any questions, you can fire them into the chat here now or follow up with our email, an email as well, because I'm more than happy to help with anything at all uh, or send you on any resources or anything like that. So just in summary, before we go, unless any questions are coming in, Ian, you're keeping an eye on that chat for me, aren't you? Yeah, there's a question in from Ushin again uh, regarding the box jump. How high should the box be? Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Um, so that one's an awkward one, Oshin. So we don't necessarily want players to jump onto the highest box they can physically get onto. We want the players to jump onto a box in a strong landing position. So if a player is just getting his feet over it, and he, when he gets onto it, his bum is nearly touching his heels and he's in a terrible landing position. That's not what we want. We want to... I'm trying to explain this without getting too technical. The way we want is the player... We want the player's centre of gravity, centre of mass that Sarah had mentioned earlier. We want that to get up as high as possible. Like, so... 
It's hard to explain. Um, if he... <laughs> Ina or Sarah, I'm floundering here trying to explain this. If, if, yeah, if, I would if, say, he, if he know where I'm going. Yeah, for me, um, you start them low because you can go and look at a, a step or a box um, that you could easily step up onto and think nothing of it. But all of a sudden, when you put a player in front of that box and ask them to go full pelt with both feet, all of a sudden they start thinking, well, now how long if my toes or my shins catches on the corner of this box, I'm snookered. Um, so there's, there's a very big mental aspect to it with, with box jumps. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is just to get the technique right in what you're doing. So I would be starting low. So um, starting with um, the likes of a step, uh, if you think of like the aerobic step up, um, the wee bench starting as low as that and just making sure that they are comfortable that they are confident and that they are performing the technique correctly and then you can start to to increase the the height from there um but there is like having gone through a, a lot of plyometrics for cruciate rehab myself there is a very me- a big mental aspect of it as well so make sure the players are comfortable conf- uh, confident and performing the technique right before worrying about getting um the the height up um that would be sort of what i would have to say at first i might um in a minute if we have failed another questions i might in the background try and pull up what i'm trying try to pull up an image that'll explain what i'm trying to say about the center of mass as well um if i get a chance now in a minute sarah do you want to go through a quick summary there on your um injury prevention end yeah, because I can see um, <laughs> I've made a mistake on the, the summary there. So uh, the mechanics that guys, just to, to recap everything, is to land softly on the ball to the midfoot. It, that should then say triple flexion. <laughs> so apologies about that, guys. That's a terrible summary. It should be <laughs> flexion, not sensing, uh, of the hip, knee and ankle. And then to, to make sure the knee is tracking over the middle toe. So obviously, guys, you are going to be looking at these things in, in real time. Um, you know, you don't have to be too specific about it. As I say, knee valgus is something that you will be able to see um, very easily. If you're not sure, if you're sitting there going, did our knee track in or not? I wouldn't be getting too worried about that because it's a very clear and obvious thing that happens. So just be making sure that the knee is tracking over the middle toe. It doesn't go beyond the toe. And that they're landing softly, and that's something that you can you can audibly hear. You don't have to be um, worrying too much about visually with that. If you're landing softly, that means you're activating everything in the correct way. If you slam down on your heel, that's when you start to hear the the noise. Uh, and then the the flexion then is just making sure that the the knee, ankle, and the hips are flexed, which is just the the bent angles that we showed you at the the knee and the hip to make sure that they're not landing with a straight leg, um, which uh, sends that shock wave basically up from the heel right up to the to the hip. And then on the power development and the jump performance, and basically first things first is it we're using the landing mechanics as a building blocks. We're not progressing anything unless the landing mechanics are right. When the landing mechanics are right, with the well obviously complement with strength training, but we're going to use our plyometrics to develop explosiveness. Uh, when we're working through our plyometrics, we're going to start with our landing mechanics, go through our slow SSC, work through to fast SSC, and we'll progress everything naturally then. So whether it be going double leg to single leg, just that we'll, we'll get our landing mechanics right first, and then we'll progress everything slowly after that. Slow Working landing mechanics, slow SSC, fast SSC. We don't need to go straight into the more advanced stuff, we can work our way up through it, especially if you're working with youth athletes, there's no rush. So there's a couple of useful resources up here. Um, so if you go on YouTube, there's the GA Athletic Development page that is loads of very helpful resources. And then we also have our YouTube page, which has our previous um, Fitness Roger webinars on it. And we will be updating with more more gym based exercises and things like that as soon as we're allowed into the gym in Dungani basically but we have a few up there already so they are our contact details so obviously feel free to reach out with anything at all after tonight um and just any questions if there's anything anyone else wants to ask now in the meantime 
Uh, just, I see David O'Neill put in the chat, I think this was in regards to the box jump. Um, his take on it was that it was like imagining jumping onto the bottom of stairs to start off, I imagine, and then progressing on from there. What would be your take on that? I, I'd say that'd be that'd be an ideal starting point in terms of starting off with the box jumps. Um, I don't know what you think of that, Ian or Sarah. Yeah, that's a pretty good way to start with it. Um, Because, again, if you start too high, if somebody doesn't have that power production within their legs, um, they're not going to be capable um, of doing, you know, the big box jumps that we've seen on on Instagram or whatever. So um, that is a good way um, on taking it step by step because they are increments that we are used to in everyday life. So, yeah, I quite like that explanation. Yeah. Yeah, very that good. Sounds good. Um, I'm just gonna try and find this other yoke in the meantime. I'm gonna all right. ignore me for a minute. Um see Noel, um he's just asking in the chat, do you have any good video links of plyometric exercises or anything like that? Um I think would the GA Athletic Development YouTube page have, have some there? I think they do. It could be open to correction on that one, but I think they do. Um off- Head, I don't know if I do, but um, if you were to go through the exercises sort of listed here and literally fire them into YouTube, you'll kind of get them. Um, I don't know off the top of, off the top of your head, Sarah. Do you, would you know any YouTube pages? Um, I'm afraid I wouldn't, but we can we can always look into that and maybe send out. Um, yeah, we can definitely do that because I'll send out the email tomorrow anyway with. Um, with the slides and with the YouTube link for anyone who wants to access the recording, so I can include something like that in the email tomorrow. Um, see something in coming in from uh, CDA Scotland. Uh, do coaches need to get injury histories from players or details of other activities before running plyometric training activities, or are these bodyweight exercises relatively safe to do with all players? It's a great question. I would look these body weight exercises would be fairly safe now obviously you'd want to know the training load in general um possibly the injury history but this the sort of stuff i've, I've kind of gone through there now that sort of stuff's fairly low level um so in terms of re-injury or anything like that it should be 100 percent safe but obviously if you do experience a severe knee injury like that they are so prevalent to them again that if obviously no one's injury history would be a huge advantage. But I think these sort of body weight exercises, especially at the landing mechanics and the slow SSD stage, is 100% um, safe to do with everyone. Yeah. Uh, another question from Oshin: What do you what do you do with a player whose knee keeps curling? Keeps knees keeps curling in I could, uh, when they're jumping. I think that was going to cover on what uh, Sarah mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah, so uh, generally when the knee uh, keeps or the knees keep tracking in towards each other, um, that's usually a hamstring issue. It's usually a weakness within the hamstring. So the first thing that you need to do is to bring it a step back. So instead of doing trying to get them to continue jumping that and then jumping that and keep telling them to, to track their toe or their knee over the toe, you need to bring it back a step the same way you would do with any sports specific skill. If they're not getting it, to bring it back a step. And the step you bring it back to is the simple squat. So that way they're in complete control the whole way down and up. There's no gravity really working on them or forces working on them the same way you do with a jump or a landing. So that gives them the time uh, to actually control their body correctly and to make sure when they're squatting down that they are continuing to track their, their knee over the toe. That's one thing to get the, the actual um, pathway in place but majority of the other work would come from strengthening the hamstrings. So there's any amount of activities you can do there for for hamstrings, um, from ab bridges, uh, lunges, again, making sure that the back knee is remaining in line with the hip and the toe and that it's not uh, tracking in as well and hip dropping, uh, Bulgarian lunges, all these kind of things. But if it's something that's really persistent, like I, you know, I wouldn't look past that, you know, speaking with the player in terms of maybe going to a physio um, to see if there's any other sort of issues that are leading into this um, and having, you know, somebody who's properly qualified to help rehabilitate that athlete to help, um, 
get the the correct technique but i definitely wouldn't be getting them to continue to jump on land to try and correct it you at the very least you're bringing it back a step to the to the squat and um then strengthening the, the hamstrings hope that makes sense this is fairly raw what i've up here but this is what i was trying to get at with Russian's question earlier so this um image i've kind of highlighted here so this is natalie jumping onto a box that he's perfectly capable of landing on his center of mass which you can see from attached to the yellow line here is high enough over the box that he's still able to land with good technique that height is perfect brilliant and then we can com contrast that with this fella here who's jumping on the box probably for instagram where you can see that his his center of mass does get up high enough over the box but not high enough up over it to land it correctly and you can see how curled up in the ball he is and it's not an effective landing. So we can, I would say that is obviously too high, whereas this man in the green T-shirt here, he's able to jump high enough to get his centre of mass high enough that he can land the technique, the technique. I'm happy with that. So that's kind of the way I'd be looking at it. If he can jump, get his, his body up high enough that he can land it properly, I'm happy. If he can't and he has to curl up in a little ball and he's just making it up, it's a different story. So I'll unshare my screen and so it's not looking at this strange Google search. Um, is that Jenny in the chat there as well, Ian, is it? Yeah, Jenny's just posted a link um, to the Be Ready to Play initiative. Do you want to talk about that or do you want me to take that? Um, yeah, so just quickly, it's... Um, the GA and their sports science committee, is that the name on it, um, have, are putting together this Be Ready to Play package and um, programme for athletes when we return to football and GA and in the coming months or the coming weeks. So that it was launched last night um, and there'll be more. But anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a program in a series made by the GA. And if you look at the people involved in it, it's made by people who are at the absolute top of their field. Um, so that'll be a great series and a great program to keep an eye on. I don't know, Jenny, if it does have plyometric elements in it yet, but it's definitely one to follow as we do return to play. Yeah, I think certainly to have the, the GA 15 as part of it, which... Um, you know, we'll obviously have a lot of elements in it that are injury prevention. Um, that will also help with uh, Oshin's question there in regards to, you know, the proper mechanics and having to build up the hamstrings, for example. So it's certainly something to look into. Yeah, so the link that Jenny put into the chat there, guys, if you just click on that link and then you'll be able to see some instructions on how to register. Um, but it's a very good initiative and we, we would like to see as many GA coaches as possible to register for this programme. Super. Um, so if there's nothing else there, guys, um, just thanks very much for taking near an hour and four, hour and 15 out of your night tonight. Uh, we really appreciate you logging on. As we edge slowly closer to our return to action. So thanks very much. Again, if you have any further questions, um, our emails are up there. So feel free to contact us with anything at all. I'll get the recording up on YouTube and I'll get the link out tomorrow. And I will have a quick look for some plyometric stuff on YouTube as well. So guys, thanks very much. And we'll see you in the near future, hopefully. Yep. Thanks very much, guys.